everyone, welcome to this video on Cybersecurity Interview Questions Part 5. This is the final part of the Cybersecurity Interview Questions series. And here, we will focus on the popular cryptography questions that can be asked in a cybersecurity interview. Our experienced instructor Bipin will take you through these questions. So, let's get started. But before we begin, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell icon to never miss an update from Simply Learn. The first question, define cryptography encryption and decryption now cryptography is used by security professionals to scramble data into non-readable format uh, which is used in securing that information so it involves converting data from a readable format into a non-readable format and then reversing it back to readable format again for example the word computer is now scrambled into looking like an unreadable format. Now, if you look at this word that it has been scrambled into, it would be very difficult for a human to figure out what the actual word was. Now, in this scenario, we have taken an algorithm where we have made a shift of the alphabet, where we have added two alphabets, the current one. So, C plus 2 becomes E, O plus 2 becomes Q, M plus 2 becomes O. So we have done a shift of 2. And thus, the key over here for this algorithm is the alphabet plus 2. So any person who figures that out will be able to unscramble this and convert this back into readable text. The fact of scrambling a readable text data into something that is unreadable by using a particular key is what cryptography is all about. Now, as we discussed, the decryption again is uh, replacing the alphabet and taking it further back by two characters. So E minus 2 becomes C, Q minus 2 becomes O, O minus 2 becomes M, and so on and so forth. So anybody who knows this key, uh, the shift key, anybody will able to decrypt this particular character. So this depends on the user. If I want to utilize alphabet plus 5, then the spacing, the shifting of that character will be the fifth character from that particular character and so on and so forth. The next question, what is the difference between ciphertext and clear text? Ciphertext refers to the text which is encrypted and totally undecipherable. The message received after decryption is known as clear text. This text is comprehensible. So the word computer is clear text. That means that it has not been treated to any cryptographic measures. It does what it is intended to be. However, if the moment we encrypt it, that means we scramble it into unreadable text by using any of the algorithms that we'll be looking at, that text is known as a cipher text. And without the key, this becomes unreadable. The clear text, as discussed, is the plain word that we have utilized. We are using the English language in this instance. So the plain word computer is the clear text. Once we add the encryption layer to it, uh, we get the cipher text to it. Moving on to the next question, what is a block cipher? This refers to the method of encrypting the plain message block by block. The plain message is broken down into fixed size blocks and then encrypted. Now a block cipher is normally used for data that is stored. So a data that is stored on a hard disk and we want to encrypt that data, that is known as block encryption or a block cipher. So a block cipher is an algorithm that will allow you to encrypt data that is stored onto a hard disk. So in this example, we've got a plain text, which is 64 bits in size, and we have added a layer of encryption to it. So plain text plus the key that we have studied in the previous questions, and then the scrambled data out of it, which is unreadable and thus encrypted. Then the next question, what is public key infrastructure? Now the public key infrastructure is a set of policies which secures the communication between a server and a client. It uses two cryptographic keys, public and private. So the infrastructure itself is a set of policies, people, procedures, and techniques which are standardized in nature and are globally accepted, which allow us to use digital certificates to encrypt data and decrypt the data uh, at the other end. We use asymmetric encryption over here, which means that we are used two keys. One is a public key to encrypt and the private key to decrypt. The other part of uh, encryption is a symmetric encryption where the same key is used to encrypt and the same key is used to decrypt. Now in a public key infrastructure, 
uh, like I said, we have standardized that. So in, uh, in the standardization part of it, the, these are the various players that have been defined in the public key infrastructure. The first is the user or the sender in this scenario, the one who requires this digital signature to digitally sign a particular transaction or a communication, a registration authority with whom they're going to register for that particular key, the certification authority who issues that key, the verification authority who validates the uh, key itself, and the recipient who's going to be the other party of that particular transaction. So how is this utilized? A sender or the user who requires this digital signature will request or apply for a digital signature with the registration authority. The registration authority would validate the uh, genuinity of the user. So they might do some uh, identity verification or uh, proof of residence or something like that. Once they've identified the uh, person, and they have validated the information, they will then send the request to the certification authority stating that the sender has been validated and we can, and the certification authority can issue the digital certificate to the particular user. They will send the public key to the sender, which will be utilized by the sender for further transactions. So when the sender is going to sign some uh, data and uh, wants to send it across to the recipient, they will use the public key to sign it and send it across. The recipient will then validate with the verification authority to see if the data, the signed data is correct or not. Now, while the certification authority sends the public key to the sender, the certification authority updates the private key with the verification authority. So whatever is signed by the uh, sender, uh, received by the recipient and they want to validate it, they will send it back to the verification authority. The verification authority will validate using the private key once the uh, private key is validated, it will then send the OK signal back to the recipient, thus allowing the validation of that particular transaction. If the signature is tampered with or is not, uh, the verification authority is not able to validate the signature, it will then send a denial message back to the recipient and the transaction will not go through. So the PKI enables trusted digital identities for people. So the PKI grants secure access to digital resources based on the infrastructure that has been created. And the core of the PKI is a certification authority which ensures that the trustworthiness of the digital data is ensured. So going back to the previous slide, these are the key players that have been standardized in the uh, public key infrastructure. The certification authority is the authority that issues the digital certificates. The validation authority is the one who validates that uh, digital certificate. Moving on, what is RSA? RSA is one of the first public key crypto systems that is used for secure data transmission. It stands for Rivesh, Shamir and Edelman. Now, these are the three people who have created this algorithm. Ron Rivest, Adi Shamir and Leonard Edelman, who are the inventors of this technique. It is an asymmetric cryptography algorithm which works on both public and private keys. Hence, the encryption key is public and the decryption key is kept private. Now, as we have discussed earlier, symmetric and asymmetric cryptography. Symmetric cryptography is where the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt. Whereas asymmetric cryptography is where there are two keys to encrypt and decrypt the algorithm. What are the few alternatives to RSA? Now, RSA is an algorithm that is used for encryption. There are a lot of other algorithms that can be utilized uh, to alter or to scramble data depending on your requirements. So in the previous question, we have studied and we have talked about what uh, RSA is. It stands for uh, Rivesh, Shamir and Edelman, the three creators of that particular algorithm. But there are a lot of alternatives to this algorithm, depending on how secure you want that data to be. And some of them are listed here on your screen. Duo Security, Okta, Google Authenticator and LastPass. LastPass is a password manager. So is Duo Security. Google Authenticator is something that we all utilize. It is an application that we can download and store on our mobile devices. And we can set that up to authenticate ourselves with certain portals. So it issues a unique ID to us, which once utilized will allow us access to those particular portals. Okta is an identity manager where you have, you have created different digital identities and you have assigned them certain permissions and based on your authentication mechanisms, Okta will allow or disallow access to those different applications or different portals as you have configured it. So all four are 
authorization and authentication mechanisms which can be used as alternatives to RSA. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Next question, what are the prime objectives of modern cryptography? And this is a very important question because we've, we've so far looked at what cryptography is and what uh, public key infrastructure is. But what is the achievement out of it? Why are we utilizing it? And what do we want to uh, gain out of it? So the main and the prime objectives of modern cryptography are uh, as follows uh, mentioned on your screen. The first one is confidentiality. The second one is non-repudiation. Third one is authenticity. And the fourth one is integrity. Now, if I go back to the first one, confidentiality, uh, that is where I want to uh, keep data confidential. That means it will only be visible to the authorized users, right? So here I have uh, created a list of people who have deemed as authorized users and I've created a digital identity to them and I've given access controls to those people. Now that is how confidentiality is ensured. So uh, when we want to keep data confidential, we create a list of users who we are going to allow access to certain resources and we are going to define what access controls are to be utilized, what access are allowed, whether they are got administrative access or user level access and only those authorized users are going to be uh, able to access these resources. That is how we maintain confidentiality. The next one is non-repudiation. Non-repudiation is the prevention of denial of having been a part of a particular transaction. So in the uh, public key infrastructure that we discussed where a digital signature was utilized to sign a particular transaction and then sent to the recipient, the sender would not be able to deny of having originated that transaction because it was using their digital certificate. Thus non-reputation comes into the picture. Uh, one more example that we can have here is uh, on our mobile phones when we use SMS short messaging service and we send a message to uh, to another person, the person when they receive a message, the number is validated by the service operator and thus the sender cannot uh, deny having sent that message. The sender at the same time can have a delivery report sent to them uh, for, uh, that the message was delivered to the inbox of the recipient and thus if the recipient denies having received that message, the delivery report becomes proof of having the, that message being delivered to their inbox. Thus, both the parties cannot deny of, have a, uh, of being a part of that particular transaction. Then comes the part of authenticity. Now, in confidentiality, we have created a digital identity assigned it to a particular person and we have given them digital signatures where they cannot deny having been a part of that transaction. But authenticity is the part where they try to prove that they are who they claim to be. So if I am claiming a digital identity, I have to prove that I am that person who I am who I'm trying to claim to be. And an example to that is when we go to our gmail.com websites, it first asks us what is our username. Our username is normally our email address, which identifies the account that we are trying to access. Right. So this account is confidential because it is only authorized for a particular person. And once they identify themselves by identifying the email address, that's when the authentication part comes into the picture where it asks for the password. Now, it has never ever happened that we just go on to the gmail.com, type in a password and then it figures out which account we are talking about. So the first step is always called, uh, the confidentiality part where we identify which account we are talking about. And then we try to authenticate as the owner of that particular account by providing the appropriate password to that account. If both of these match, only then do we get access to that account and we are able to make uh, whatever transactions we want to make. Now, when we are making those transactions, non-reputation comes into the place where all our activities also being logged. So we have identified our account, we have authenticated ourselves by providing the password. So the proof is there that it is us who are trying to access it. And then whatever activity we do, send an email, receive an email, delete something, attach something, all of those activities are logged and stored as proof of what actions have been done. So tomorrow, if we deny having sent that email, Gmail can still prove to us through those logs that the, that, that activity was done by us. And the fourth part is integrity, which ensures that the data received and sent and the, uh, sent by the sender and received by the recipient has not been modified while in uh, motion. 
So the integrity part is the trustworthiness of that data that the data has not been modified by any hacker or any other uh, entity and is still trustworthy. So these are the four prime objectives of modern cryptography. Once I have scrambled that data using my public uh, signature, it is only my private signature that is going to decrypt it, right? Uh, using these mechanisms, I will be able to achieve all these four aspects of cryptography and security. Next question, what is SAFER? Now SAFER stands for Secure and Fast Encryption Routine, which is also a block cipher. As we have discussed pre previously, Block cipher is a cipher that is used to encrypt data that is stored. So it has a 64-bit block size and byte-oriented algorithm. Uh, Safer's encryption and decryption procedures are highly secure. This technology is widely used in applications like digital payment cards. So when you're using your, a digital payment gateway to make transactions, so you have, you have gone onto an online portal, you want to purchase a particular item, and then it takes you to another payment gateway where you have to fill in your credit card information, sensitive information like your uh, expiry date, CVV information, and then the OTP or the password that you have created for your particular account. Now, all of these need to be secured or highly secured based on PCI DSS, which is the payment card industry data security standard. So these standards ensure that certain protocols are utilized to attain that level of security. Safer is one of those block ciphers that is used under the digital payment gateway infrastructure. Next question, how does the public infrastructure, public key infrastructure work? Now we have already discussed this in the previous diagrams. Uh, we have identified the key players, the certification authority, the registration authority, the end user who requires the digital certificate, the validation authority who's going to validate it, and then the recipient, the end user with whom the transaction is going to be uh, conducted. So the first point here is uh, the request for the digital certificate is sent to the registration authority. They validate it and then they okay to the certification authority who then process the request and the digital certificate is issued to the person who has requested it. So when the person wants to conduct that transaction, they use that uh, digital certificate to sign that transaction with the end user. The end user validates that with the validation authority and once validated, the transaction goes through. And now the last question, what is the Blowfish algorithm? It is a 64-bit symmetric encryption algorithm. So this is an algorithm that uses the same key to encrypt and the same key to decrypt. The same secret keys used to encrypt and decrypt the messages. Here the operations are based on exclusive ORs and additions to the on 32-bit words. The key has a maximum length of 448 bits. Now this is a little bit technical. Uh, you might not want to go this technical in an uh, in an interview question. You just need to identify what the algorithm is used for. So whether it is a symmetric algorithm, which means it uses the same key, or uh, a, a symmetric algorithm where it uses a public key to encrypt and a pi private key to decrypt. Uh, thus, the Blowfish algorithm is just one more algorithm uh, which uses symmetric encryption to encrypt and decrypt data. Algorithms that we have seen, RSA and uh, others that we have discussed, as far as the interview questions are concerned, what we need to remember is uh, which algorithms are symmetric, which algorithms are asymmetric, what do symmetric algorithms do, and what do unsymmetric uh, asymmetric algorithms do. And we also look at block ciphers and stream ciphers. Block ciphers are utilized to encrypt data that is stored, stationary data, data at rest, and stream ciphers are utilized for data in motion while they are being streamed. So SSL and TLS is another algorithm that comes into the picture when we are looking at streaming data. And with that, we have come to the end of the Cybersecurity Interview Questions Part 5 on Cryptography. I hope it was informative and interesting. If you have any questions related to the topics that were covered in this video, please ask away in the comment section below. Our team will help you solve your queries. Thanks for watching, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.